Shadowversity t-shirts and hoodies. They are special. Available through Teespring, link in the description. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and this is one of those videos where I need to address a misconception that has arisen mainly due to pop culture, which is unfortunate because I love pop culture. Specifically, what I'm talking about in this video is the Paladin crotch flap thing. Whenever this item of clothing is given to someone, it is generally to reflect a type of religious sentiment, which is why the paladin more predominantly wears it. But not just the paladin, it also is there to present someone's allegiance. And when a name is given to this in certain pop culture kind of properties, it is called a tabard. The greatest offender that comes to my mind in this regard is World of Warcraft, because you can get a Tabard, and you can put it on any character, it doesn't need to be a paladin, and you can also ascribe your guild logo or symbol or whatever on that piece of clothing. As to how prevalent this misconception is, I've seen kind of varying levels of, uh, I guess, misconception, because when you type in Tabard in, say, a regular Google search, it's funny, you get a lot of uh, unhistorical things as a result, because there's a lot of confusion between what is this thing that the paladin is wearing, uh, a bit of between this and a surcoat, and an actual historical tabard. And from looking at the results of a Google search, it does seem to appear that there is a misconception or an idea that a tabard is a type of surcoat, which no, it's not. So a tabard is not this crotch flap thing that paladins are wearing, and it isn't a surcoat either. So in this video, I'm going to clear up everything and hopefully bring us to a greater understanding and a more historically accurate understanding because the tabard <laughs> in quotes as depicted in say world of warcraft and classic fantasy it actually is a historical piece of religious clothing but it is not what is historically understood or what we understand historically, as a tabard. It's quite different, okay? What paladins are generally wearing is what is actually known as a monastic scapula. And that is not to be, you know, uh, confused with a devotional scapula, which is quite different. No, 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 the more kind of historical medieval version of it, okay, is a monastic scapula. And you can do a Google search in there, and look what comes up, all right? That's the classic paladin kind of wearing, you know, cloth thingy, isn't it? And so I'm not saying that paladins shouldn't be wearing this type of, you know, cloth over their armor, because it actually suits them quite well, because there are, you know, paladins are based in religion, eh? where they either serve, you know, a god or whatever in type of the fantasy that they're referring to. It makes sense for them to be wearing this type of clothing for similar reasons as to why historical clergymen and monks wore them. But what I am saying is that it should be called the correct name. It's not a tabard, okay? It is a scapula. Now, where does a scapula come from, okay? How did it arise in the medieval period? Actually, technically the earliest reference is like, you know, uh, 700 AD, around there, which, depending on your uh, definition of the medieval period, is within the medieval period, but I tend to think of that, you know, a bit before that. Anyway, I've made videos about that. But officially, yes, it's in the medieval period. Okay, so how did it arise? Well, uh, technically, it originally came from aprons, okay? Oh, you know, the, the type of apron you wear when you're working to prevent dirt and stuff uh, getting on you. But hang on, how did religious people, why did they wear aprons? Well, it's because they did a lot of work, okay? If you go to the monk orders in the medieval period, these places were centers of industry, not just religion. So the monks, okay, they, uh, uh, you know, entered into many different industries because they owned land, and owning land was like one of the key big things of making lots of money in the medieval period. They brewed beer, farmed land, made cheese and wine, raised crops, worked mills, made cloth and ran smiths as well as a number of other things as well. Because if you have the land, you can then use the land to produce things. And when it comes to the manual labor stuff, aprons. Yeah, like if you're working or forge, stuff like that, it wasn't uncommon for aprons to be around in these situations and circumstances. And a connection seems to have been bridged between the concept of working for, I guess, producing stuff like that, and the type of 
religious work you do in expressing your devotion to God. And so the scapula was actually expected to be worn whenever you were undertaking certain types of religious practice, running mass or even attending mass, because it was a type of work you did for God. And it also became a symbolic representation of the yoke of Christ. What's the yoke of Christ? It comes from a direct scripture from the Bible, specifically the 11th chapter of Matthew verses 29 and 30, where the Savior says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is a yoke? Well, when you have animals, regularly oxen, pulling something large, yeah, they have, there's this big wooden thing that rests on their necks with a kind of a loop underneath their neck. That is a yoke, that is what you pull. And so when Christ is saying, take my yoke upon you, he's saying, take my burden upon you, which is the burden of following him, keeping his commandments and stuff like that. And so the scapula became a kind of physical, you know, piece of clothing that symbolically represented bearing or taking upon yourself the yoke of Christ because it was around your neck and over your shoulders. And in fact, certain blessings became associated with wearing the scapula. And this is a kind of interesting bridge that you could make into fantasy that it might have certain, you know, divine properties associated with it, which of course would explain why a character like a paladin would be wearing this item of clothing. And it's also an outwards kind of representation of the personal commitments one has made to, well, God in the traditional sense. And in fantasy, you could say to a specific cause. So let's call it what it is. A paladin wears a scapula. Which brings us to the next half of this video. What is a tabard? All right, if that's not a tabard, what actually is a tabard? Well, a tabard is a much smaller type of garment. It's interesting that, you know, I can see why some of the confusion arises because tabard sometimes were not connected on the sides. They had a front flap and a back flap, but they generally ended at the thighs and lowest at the knees, but they weren't thin to hang down like, you know, in between the legs. They were generally as, at least as wide as a person, sometimes even wider, and they kind of look like these belts. Tops. One of the purposes of tabards was to present the knight's coat of arms or device so other knights could recognize them and also in official proceedings and especially in tournaments. To my knowledge, I haven't found of any instances where an actual knight was wearing a scapula. Traditional tabards were much, much shorter and wider, okay? Sometimes they only came down to about the hips, sometimes lower, sometimes they were sewn up on the sides, sometimes they didn't, sometimes they had flaps of cloth hanging down on the sides of the arms and sometimes they didn't. There's a bit of variance in the types of tabards throughout the medieval period and also geographical location. And I think this is what has caused the confusion between what is a tabard and what is a surcoat, because surcoats also often bore the knight's sigil device coat of arms, and certain types of tabards do have a lot of similarities to certain types of surcoats. Not all of them though. And so a tabard that was not sewn on the sides and had a front flap and back flap that was lengthened past the knee would really become a scapula and would be a tabard. I haven't found any instances of this being done historically or instances in which a knight was actually wearing a monastic scapula. That's probably because they'd be rather inconvenient to wear on a horse. The overcoat the knights wore that presented their coats of arms that were longer, meaning surcoats, had a functional split down the middle. A scapula on the other hand would always hang down on one side of the horse. It would flap around when riding and potentially get tangled in things. There's even been some kind of mutated reproductions that you can buy on online. Take a look at this thing. Doesn't really know whether it's a surcoat or a tabard or even a scapula for that matter. If it didn't have that split down the middle, it would be a scapula. If it didn't hang past the thighs, it would be a tabard. And if it was sewn up on the sides and had the same length and pretty much the same proportions, it would be a surcoat. Even though it's not exactly like a historical surcoat or scapula, it has far more in common with those two things than a historical tabard. And if I was to name this thing, I personally would call it a type of surcoat. Yet, of course, it is so as a tabard. Could there have been some tabards that were exceptionally long? It's possible. But as I mentioned before, that would be less functional and more awkward for a knight to wear over his armor. That is why most tabards that you see knights wearing over their armor are actually rather short. So let me quickly summarize those distinctive characteristics that help define each garment separate to another. Surcoats will cover the front of the body to the sides. It doesn't necessarily need to be sewn on the sides, but more predominantly they were. They are longer garments hanging underneath the knee, somewhere between the shin 
in and have a split down the middle. A scapula is defined by a front flap and a back flap that is not sewn on the sides and is thinner with a flap that hangs down in between the legs. It does not have a split down the middle. A tabard generally has a front flap and a back flap, the longest ones reaching the knee, more often they were much shorter, and they were wide. They covered the front of the body and the back, sometimes even wider. There we go, those are the three distinctions. Surcoat, scapula, and tabard. And a circuit and scapula are not tabards, okay? Let us not get this confused. One of the more classical tabards that you probably have seen in, in movie depictions, stuff like that, is that of the Three Musketeers. Yes, what they are wearing in the Three Musketeers is a tabard. Quite different to what the fantasy paladins are wearing, isn't it? But that is it. That is a tabard, this is a surcoat, and what the paladins classically wear in fantasy is a scapula. Specifically, a religious monastic scapula. Which does make sense. So, paladins, they can still wear it. Let's just call it the right thing. Thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you again. Until that time, farewell.